I'm Scott Hajek. I'm talking to you um, about, um, as a data scientist, in, in an experience that I had uh, collaborating with an application development team and the learnings that came out of that to make that um, as efficient and, and positive a collaboration as possible. So I'm going to, after briefly telling you a little more about myself, I'm going to talk to you about how part of the solution to this question of collaboration was a data science API, um, why that was a good thing, and um, what contract testing is and what, why that was also part of, important part of making that collaboration successful. Um, how, in particular, our way of solving that problem was something called JSON schema, and uh, how to use it in your testing, and then also to use it to give better error messages. Um, so, like most data scientists and superheroes, I have a backstory and an origin story that's not uh, uh, wasn't data science. So, um, so initially, I was uh, doing psycholinguistics and phonetics research. Um, but in the last five years, I've been in the New York area focusing on machine learning and uh, software development. Um, and then I work for Pivotal Software, which if you're not familiar with it, they, um, they have both products and services. And their products in include platforms for distributed data and applications. So if you've heard of Cloud Foundry or uh, as an application platform or Green Plum Database, for example, as a distributed data platform, um, those are examples. And then on the services side, uh, we have data science and we have agile software development. And um, you know, a lot of times we might be engagements where it's just data science or just um, agile software development. Um, and they're, you know, they can be very quick. So we have to we go in and, and do some great stuff in, in short, amount of, short amounts of time, like three months or so. Um, but in this, uh, the inspiration for this talk came from a, a case where it was actually a joint engagement. So it was a balanced team um, with, with data science and software developments. And, um, and it also, um, you know, I got excited about incorporating data science directly into uh, what's being actually used in applications. Um, so that, and, uh, that first experience with this was, you know, brought about the question, how do we actually collaborate? Um, you know, I, I definitely heard of an experience before the, you know, doing some toy modeling and proving something out and then throwing the, everything over the wall and then having some other team re-implement it, most of it incorrectly and it being a nightmare. Um, but in this case, we're, we, we wanted to be cohesive, but at the same time, uh, you know, agile software development is not the same as agile data science. You know, our iteration cycles are different, and a lot of about our process um, might not quite align. So um, we wanted independence between our teams and loose coupling between the components. And most of all, we didn't want to break each other's code. Um, and, and that had been a problem. Um, and specifically, you know, this project, I'm not going to focus on the uh, in, ins and outs of the specific data science problem that it was solving, but uh, just know that it was um, the, the problem space is manufacturing and uh, a large manufacturer needing to uh, optimize how they commit to and deliver um, the, their, their product uh, manufacturing schedule. Um, and then they wanted an application for the people who have to make those decisions uh, to make recommendations. So the, um, the application development team, for a variety of reasons of the business, um, were required to write their stuff in C-sharp. And then I started racking my brains, OK, what, what do I know about data science in C-sharp? The answer was nothing. Um, but I have a lot of experience uh, doing it in Python. And so our way of forging forward was to do two separate microservices, and, or you know, two, two services. And we would, um, and, and I'll talk more about this, but we would provide an, an, a RESTful API for them to send requests to. Um, most of you probably know, but API is an application programming interface. And how I describe it is that if you have a resource that you want others to be able to programmatically use, um, then, then that interface is, is an API. Um, and it, at least in my mind, the, they're kind of a spectrum or different ways of thinking about it. You could have it just be a library or a package, uh, like uh, Scikit-Learn, where you know I'm I'm going to use it, but it's within the same language, probably even on the same machine, um, you know that, that I'm doing. Or on the other end, you could have a, a, a RESTful um, 
web service like uh, you know Google Vision APIs or you know a variety of all the APIs we hear about, and then in those cases it's these HTTP post and get requests um, that are sent over, and you get answers back. So, um, what in, in our case, you know, like so, what what would it be good? What would success for our team look like, um, or in general with an API? And it, you know, obviously something needs to be useful. Otherwise, you know, why have it? Why use it at all? But at the same time, it needs to be useful without necessarily needing to open the black box. That's not to say that, uh, that it should be closed source and, and they're not allowed to look at what you have, but they shouldn't have to rely on it in order for it to be useful. Um, and so let's, let's envision an API that is a, a quiz show clue answering service. And so, you know, speaking of how things are implemented, um, you know, Ken Jennings and IBM Watson are implemented extremely differently but the, the same expectation is that, uh, that Alex Trebek should be able to provide a clue and get uh, an answer in the appropriate format. Uh, whether that's right or not, it's another question. But the, um, so here, here it is. So after a demonstration of this, the April 8, 1927 New York Times said, commercial use in doubt. Any guesses? <laughs> What's a computer? What's the television? Um, so, uh, importantly, you know, in Jeopardy, the clues always have to be as a statement, and the responses have to be as a question. So, if Alex Trebek had asked, uh, it, turn this statement into a question, um, it would have broken the expectation of of the participants. And also, if they had responded just television or it is the television, that would not have been counted as a correct answer. Um, so a lighthearted view of, of an interface and, and why form matters. Um, you know, Scikit-Learn, I'm sure everyone uses and loves, and one of the things that makes it great is that reliable interface. You give it, uh, you instantiate a classifier, you fit, you have a dot fit method to, and, and data in a certain kind of format, you get a trained model. You take a trained model, you can do predict probability, and as long as your new data has the same, you know, shape as the input, uh, training data, then you get class probabilities, or if it's um, or if it's regression, then uh, you know you can do dot predict and get uh, predicted value. So um, now the important thing with uh, Scikit-Learn is that you know it's uh, you're meant to you know keep track of what your matrix looks like, and um, and so at the level of Scikit-Learn, it doesn't care about column names or row names or any other metadata. Um, but, you know, so this, um, you know, I was playing around with the Boston housing data set, and so, you know, some of the columns are crime rate, percent residential, percent business, percent, uh, or, you know, whether it's a waterfront property. But if all you had is that matrix, it could just as well be the percent on times, which, uh, on time trains, which in New York is abysmal, um, the square foot of your bathroom, which is also kind of small or negligent, um, the average taco price, which drives a lot of my decisions, and whether or not they allow dogs, which also drives my decision, because I like my dog. Um, so, you know, you don't know just from looking at the data. So self-describing formats, that's one thing that I learned. You know, at first I tried just giving them, um, you know, like matrices, lists, and whatnot, and that uh, didn't go over so well. So they wanted something more self-describing, you know, so uh, dicts with keys with meaningful, you know, the, the keys for what the data are, uh, you know, passing it into a prediction function and giving something back, um, you know, again with, you know, a self-describing format. The other thing that I learned is that um, you don't necessarily want to give just the like just the data portion. You always want to leave yourself some room to tack on some metadata and have some room to grow. Um, and then you have to few, make fewer changes later down the line. Um, so you know, I added this you know, request type and response type, and then the data is just a one value key value in there. Um, but this is the contract. So this is you know, at first I mocked up. Uh, uh, an example of input data um, and an example of output data, and then I gave it to um, the other app dev team, and then said, "Okay, like my stuff is going to look like this," um, and so that's the contract. If you give me something on the left, I'll give you something like on the right. Um, but you know, it turns out that just an example might not be sufficient. Um, you know, like you gave a, a a number that looks like a a, a float, but can you sometimes be passing a, an integer or vice versa and so forth? Or can it be null and things like that? So, you know, so contract testing um, 
and also if you um, also if you you know if you say this but just leave it on your shared drive and then never reference it in your uh, then you could vary from from that contract without knowing it so testing is what ensured that we stayed in sync it gave us that independence to do our own thing like as soon as we got the API set up um, then they got to go on the do on the, their own thing and at first we just gave some dummy responses and that was great to just give us some breathing room. Um, it also gave us the, the, the power to refactor with confidence so that you know, once you start getting really complex, you change, um, you're worried about, oh, if I change this code over here, if, um, you know, maybe I wanna clean this up. Is it gonna break my, how I'm interacting with everyone else? Um, this ensures that it doesn't. And also, uh, uh, I, we can give better error messages because um, uh, initially, if anything wrong in our app happened, including if they gave us bad input, um, they would just get a 500 error, which is, you know, it's generically something on this application went wrong, which is not so useful because they don't know if it's a problem on our end or if they gave bad input. Um, so, <clears throat> all right, so let's do contract testing. Let's, let's do this. So my first thought was, okay, if I have some canned input and know what uh, it's supposed to give for output um, and, and some canned output, then I'll check my actual output against the canned output and, um, um, and then we're good to go. Like maybe even exact strings, strings match, wait a minute. Keys in, in sort of objects in JSON or, or in dictionaries could be in different orders, but it's still technically the same thing. Okay, that doesn't work. Okay, let's encode special numbers. Like I know that I'm, my prediction is gonna be like a, a uh, hundred thousand dollars is is going to be the price for this one input, but actually, you know, as a data scientist, I actually hope that my model would change over time and get better. So it's not going to always be the same values. So it makes it very brittle if you do it that way, or you might add or subtract metadata, and things uh, won't pass. So our answer to this, and I was very grateful for learning from the seasoned software developers, was uh, JSON schema, which is a way to make clear and explicit um, what you're expecting as input and to give as output. And you can use it directly in your testing, um, and as well as the people consuming your API can use that same schema in their contract tests. Um, and so, so JSON schema is a specification for annotating and validating JSON documents. Um, and so it itself is written in JSON, and there are validators that exist for a variety of languages, so actually that's part of where the power comes in because they were doing their stuff in C-sharp, me and Python, but this same contract, this same schema, we could both use directly. So they have this one point of reference and if both our you know, validators work on both ends, we're good to go. Um, so just to give you a taste of JSON schema if you're not familiar with it. Um, so let's say we have a, a JSON uh, about a person Oh, let me pause just a second. I meant to say in the beginning, if, if there's ever a question along the way, I'm happy to take questions uh, mid-stride as well. Um, so if there's a JSON uh, describing a person, and we have um, a John, who's 30 years old, not married, and likes apple and kiwi, um, a schema might look something like this, where uh, there's a, you know, the overall object is an, what's called a, an object that's a, you know, from, J from JavaScript. Uh, no, terminology, and then it has these uh, name, age, married uh, properties, and it tells what types they are. And then even for the favorite fruits, it says you know that's an array, but the things inside it are are strings. Um, just as a, a a note, though, by default, um, these are all optional. So if you uh, so this is good, but so is an empty object, um, and so is adding additional fields. Now, depending on what you're doing, that may or not, may not be good behavior that you want. And so what you can do is there are also ways of saying required properties uh, uh, or that additional properties are not allowed um, and, or, or that those name and age, for example, are required. Um, and so that way you can start constraining things, which is, is good. Um, the other thing you can even do is go even further and say, well, age can be, has to be an integer, but it also needs to be between 0 and 200. Um, so that they don't give you negative numbers or like a million. Um, I'm being generous, uh, 200, because uh, you know I don't want to put it uh, too low because medicine is advancing at a rapid pace. So the other thing is I thought about okay, 
Um, what if you're nesting complex objects when e within each other? So siblings are, uh, so this is a, a person object. A sibling is a person too. So you know, I should be able to say that, uh, that one of the properties is siblings and it's an array, but it's an array of type person. So there's a lot of um, uh, power and, and complexity that you can build in. And um, again, I'm not focusing on the use case that I was working with, but with this optimization problem um, and the, the complex business domain logic and the, um, all the constraints that they had, you know, the, the business domain was very complex and therefore all of the inputs had to be very complex. And so that's especially when JSON schema came to our rescue because um, any other simpler, you know, even if you're using good testing practices, but uh, it, 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 gets, it gets gnarly. So um, other things that are available as ways of constraining the, the schema is uh, you can look for specific values, um, you can look for you know, the size of the array, uh, you can have conditional or Boolean logic, uh, you can define, have defined formats like date and time, email addresses, and regular expressions and so forth. And there's, there's a lot more, it's a very powerful standard. So going into this, I actually didn't even know a quarter of all this when I actually, when they told me about it and before I started benefiting from it. What I did at first is they said, okay, there's this thing called JSON schema, go to, the, go to quick type and use this tool. So you drop in JSON and you can get a schema out um, and it's kind of generic. There aren't maybe quite as many constraints as you'd want, but it's a great starting point. And there's even uh, options for instead of outputting JSON, you can um, uh, tell it to give you the Python code for parsing that JSON, even if it's these complex objects with what end up being different classes and all of that. Um, and, and so the other thing that's important for me is because a lot of times my, uh, you know, it, the data is sensitive and so I'd like to use some real data as the example to make sure it's, uh, you know, in generating the schema, but at the same time I'm not allowed to do anything that sends the data to some random whoever runs this quick type application on the internet. So two things, one is that the, the maintainers of this claim that it's all just in the local client JavaScript code that it doesn't send the data anywhere. The other thing is that there's a command line tool um, that you could turn off your internet if you're really paranoid and, and do it that way. Uh, so this is just a, a view of what the interface ends up looking like and when I dropped in my example of JSON and, on the, um, and the important thing is you have to select um, you know, what, what you want to give it as input and how you want it out on the right. Um, so you can see on the right, it, it fills in some of the boilerplate um, and then um, it'll even do some smart um, assumptions like um, it's cut off here, but the data key is then uh, an array of type datum so it even smartly figures, okay, if you're, you know, the naming and, and all of that, it, it figures, okay, then um, I'm going to make a separate subclass and subdefinition for, for all of those elements. Um, so moving on, like that, that's to give a flavor of the power of this. So, and, and I said that one of the keys was to be able to incorporate this into tests. Um, and so testing is, is super simple. There's a JSON schema uh, package in Python. And so you can use any test framework you want, but the key is that uh, two things to, to let you know, it has to be the parsed JSON. So it's not just the raw JSON string um, that this library requires as input. Um, so it's, you know, you json.load. Um, the other thing is um, that then you just take, in this case, I imported whatever my predict function is um, that takes that good request that I have a, as, as an example and then I get the re response, and then um, and then I have then there's JSON schema dot validate, um, giving the instance first, and then the response schema on the right. And if it if it's correct, it um, it's like a, a no operation. But if it fails, it raises an exception, a validation error, um, and that that's how you test on it. And so the the benefit from all this is that you. You're, you, there's a lot of benefits aside from hopefully breaking each other's code less often, but there's also the opportunity for you know, A-B testing becomes easier because as soon as you have a, a very solid um, contract, then swapping out implementations is super easy in terms of, um, you know, like if you have 
um, you know, someone goes to a website and it's randomly decided which, uh, which version of the API to call, but it's that the call is the same and the, what they're getting back is the same. So A-B testing becomes easier, more robust. Um, also, if you um, want to do test-driven development, which is something that um, on the application development side at Pivotal they really focus on, where that's where you, even before you start writing the code, you, you write your tests and then just do whatever it takes to get those tests passed um, and then refactor. Um, uh, so that's a possibility. Um, doesn't always make sense for data science, but it's really, it was fun the times I've tried it, fun and useful. And then most importantly, there's continuous integration, which if you're not familiar with that, that's just a way that if you have uh, a way of deploying your code and you have test suites, then when you push your code, then it automatically runs on the tests and if they all pass, then it can be pushed into you know, actual use and if not, then it catches it before it gets pushed out. Um, all kinds of benefits that came from that. Uh, and then the, the last one that I'm going to speak to is giving better error messages. Um, so, for example, um, if I have a, a bad request and then my request schema, I <coughs> gave, um, it, you know, it throws this validation error and then it gives very specific information that I had given uh, 2.31 actually as a string instead of a, a float. Uh, or a number, and, and so it gives that really specific information and where in the uh, object uh, and where in the schema it, it broke. Now one note about that is that this validation throws, uh, it, it throws on the first wrong thing. Um, what I found to be useful was that uh, maybe they actually made more than one mistake in the request, um, so they, wanna know what, they would want to know what all of them are. So just in, as an example, how to enumerate all those. Um, then you, you instantiate a, a validator um, from the JSON schema, schema draft validator. And then, uh, and then with that, you can iter errors. Um, and so then that way you're, you're getting all that information and you can build in some kind of error message to, to pass back to them as part of the response. Just uh, so to recap, um, Approaching this collaboration with the application development side of things was uh, uh, really helped by having a data science API. It helped us be simultaneously independent, but also staying in lockstep, being cohesive. Um, the contract testing is, is a way to, to actually ensure that and give you some clarity and confidence in doing so. Um, and in particular, you know, there might, there's, I'm sure there are plenty of other tools, but I found JSON schema to be a pretty lightweight way for a data scientist to uh, achieve all of this without, you know, going too far off the deep end for all the other fancy stuff that software developers um, do. Um, and because it's explicit, it's standardized, and there's tooling uh, around it. Um, to test with it, it's as simple as, you know, installing it and the dot validate method. And, um, and as I mentioned, you can iterate through all the errors and give really good error messages uh, and be as useful um, part of that collaboration as, as you can. Uh, I, I've made a few notes. Um, the, the thinking about things in terms of uh, magic numbers and avoiding them is something that some uh, ideas from some of my colleagues and also um, some other colleagues have talked about an API first approach for data science um, and some links to other uh, the, the tools that I've mentioned and the, and the specifications. Um, I'm eager to, uh, you know, get in touch with anyone. If, in, if anyone wants to follow up, um, they can follow up through Twitter. Um, and, you know, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Yeah, okay, I'll leave that here. Any any questions or comments? So Do we pass around a mic or? Oh, it's okay. Go ahead. You talk about trying to avoid estimatic numbers, like to see if for a certain input you predict a specific output, um, and then you switch to the JSON schema testing. Mm -hmm. so do you have any replacement for like ensuring that your model's uh, performance does something? <coughs> yeah, that's that that is interesting because uh, the magic number approach. At first, sounds good because you're simultaneously somewhat testing that you know uh, the the right shape of things at the same time as testing um, uh, testing the actual response. Um, but it turns out that then um, 
uh, one thing that I learned from, from those um, software engineering colleagues is that then you're testing two things at once, and then as soon as you want to change how or what you're testing in either one of those, then you have to change all of it. And so it's actually, um, you may have heard you know, phrases like separation of concerns and all that kind of thing. Um, you know, the same goes with testing. So if you, so in saying to use JSON schema, I'm uh, not recommending that as a replacement for having other tests that test specifically, you know, that, that you know, your output, um, you know, the JSON schema is not gonna tell you if that was the actual optimal output. You need other tests to do that, um, but it should be other tests. It shouldn't be the same one, and it makes life a lot easier. Any other questions? So, so it sounds like you fell in love with JSON. Did you consider, <coughs> consider any other data formats that, and rejected them, maybe? Um, no, in this case, I... Uh, it was, you know, it's, it's something that I knew about and the developers obviously knew about. I mean, there's things that I, I know of but would never consider it, it like XML um, because, uh, yeah, and there are validators for XML as well, but, um, but you know, it's, it's, it's so much more verbose um, and it's not, you know, friendly on the eyes, even though this is all an automated you know, process, and it doesn't have to be friendly on the eyes, but if you want to peek at things, it's more helpful. Um, but on the other end, there's like YAML, which is even more human readable, but then, um, uh, and there are pretty good, you know, there are good parsers for it out there and all that, but um, so that was, in my mind, the happy medium of having something that's pretty human readable, um, but, you know, but, but very systematic. And actually, you know, so this is just one, um, you know, JSON schema is just one way of trying to tackle this problem, but I'm kind of curious if, if anyone out here um, uh, has tackled it in a different way and found that useful. Um, another, you know, buzzword that you might hear from um, software developers are you know, these whole frameworks like Swagger or other kinds of things. And you know, I'm, I know very little about them, but after just some quick Google, Googling, it looks like they support things like JSON schema. So like, you know, that's another benefit of choosing something where there's a lot of tooling around it. And so you know, if, even if they are using some really high power uh, tooling that you yourself may not use, but then at least you have this like contract between you that, that you can understand. How'd you end up deploying your API? Flask or? Yeah, yeah. So it was a Flask app, and um, so and we were using Cloud Foundry, which uh, is um, it's it's a platform for easily um, deploying applications and also making it easy for multiple applications to talk to each other. Um, and so actually, that's also another technology and um, that made it really easy to deploy, like even I was knew how to, to push the application. And so that bro broke down some barriers of, of needing to go through some operations person each time I wanted to make a change. And the other cool thing was that, you know, I could make this push and actually, um, you know, the very first iteration of the model was uh, pretty much a dummy model and, and kind of uh, garbage, opti you know, non-optimal values. But then as it got better, um, I would just, you know, push those changes and they didn't have to change anything on their side. It's just what was showing up in the app was just better, the results. Great, well, uh, thank you all for your time and um, I look forward to the rest of the conference with you.